Hi everyone, and thanks for inviting me to share World Population Day with you. Just bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, so World Population Day is the day when the United Nations reaffirms the importance of women's reproductive rights and how gender equity is the key to sustainability. These are great sentiments, but what you won't hear them say is that population growth is a problem. They won't tell you that global fertility rate barely fell at all in the last decade. They're more likely to stress the assumed problems of an aging population than to warn that the failure to increase family planning efforts will lock whole regions into increasing destitution and escalate all of our environmental crises. This is the nature of the population taboo, but how did we get here? Back in the 1950s, people had the foresight to see that rapid population growth in underdeveloped countries would cause increasing hardship. By the 1970s, modern contraceptives were cheap and effective, and a number of countries had family planning programs to get the birth rate down. By the 1980s, some lessons have been learned about how not to do it, including the coercive measures that were used briefly in India and aggressively in China under the one child policy. But at the same time, developing countries had seen the successes and were more convinced than ever of the importance of reducing population growth. But already the Catholic campaigners had been at work in the USA and had shifted the Reagan government's position to one of regarding population growth as a neutral phenomenon. They said, for every extra mouth, God provides a pair of hands and that humans are the ultimate resource. And so was born the revisionist thesis on population and development, discrediting earlier motivations for voluntary family planning as a vital part of development strategies. Then we get to the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development held in Cairo, and it's now famous shifting of the paradigm away from so-called demographic goals to focused almost exclusively on women's reproductive health and rights. The family planning practitioners at Cairo welcomed the foregrounding of women's health and empowerment. They had always pushed for client focused services and against coercion. But inexplicably, the women's health movement came to the view that demographic goals were their enemy, rebranded as neo Malthusianism and population control, rather than seeing them as useful motivator for politicians to support women's rights and empowerment. This anti-Malthusian sentiment ambushed many family planning practitioners who'd seen themselves as champions of women's rights, but suddenly found themselves labelled the population mafia. And so we now have a paradigm built on myths and non sequiturs. The first non sequitur is that demographic goals, such as any explicit preference for smaller families or less population growth, inherently invoke coercive measures like forced abortions and sterilisations. Let's not forget that this myth was largely engineered by the Holy See, an institution that is deeply misogynist and has a policy of coercive childbearing. This quote on this slide is the entire treatment of population growth in the UN's 2014 review of the Cairo Program of Action. It's a 235 page report and population is relegated to a disparaging footnote. It begins by rewriting history, claiming that overpopulation concern was politicised in ironic contrast to the denialism that they have politicised, and that it directly resulted in population control without heed to people's reproductive aspirations, their health or the health of their children. An appalling misrepresentation of programs that were fundamentally hum humanitarian and about the health of women and children. It goes on to assert the claim that pursuing general development and rights for women will lead to lower population growth than targeted efforts for birth control, which is to say that family planning promotion was always unnecessary, ineffective and inappropriate. Another gross misrepresentation, but they have the temerity to claim that this report assembles evidence confirming this assertion when it made not even the vaguest attempt to test it there's been a growing body of literature supporting the opposite conclusion that 
by discrediting population stabilization as a motive for delivering family planning services, funding plummeted, and not only has there been more population growth, but more women lack access to birth control, leading to more unwanted pregnancies, more maternal and infant deaths, less economic freedom and education access for women, less poverty reduction and food security than there would otherwise have been. As the family planning veteran Malcolm Potts said, the ultimate tragedy is that the idealism at Cairo has actually left women worse off. But the UN refuses to countenance any failure of the Cairo agenda. In the few minutes I have left, I want to present some data to press two points that I think are vital for reasserting the moral imperative for rapid population stabilization. The environmental imperative should trump everything, but it doesn't get a look in against these two prevailing myths. My first claim is that voluntary family planning programs were the most effective interventions ever implemented for promoting economic development and empowerment of women. I want to dispel the myth that the pre-Cairo national family planning programs, the sort that actually promoted the very real benefits of small families, were unnecessary, ineffective and inappropriate, and that fertility decline is best driven by girls' education and reducing poverty. The chart here shows that um, many countries had rapid fertility declines and they were all countries that implemented strong family planning efforts. The decline starts very abruptly, marking the start of their family planning program. Even for China, most of the decline happened under a voluntary program started around 1970, well before the one child policy came in in 1979. These transitions had little to do with girls' education or economic advancement. There's no case of rapid fertility decline that was not due to national family planning programs. In the next charts, all developing countries are grouped according to how fast birth rates fell. The countries in the green group all had strong voluntary family planning programs and birth rates fell very fast. And after about 40 years, their population growth is coming to an end. All these countries are powering ahead in terms of development, but the development came after the fertility decline, not before. In contrast, the red group, most of which still have more than four children per woman, have on average gone nowhere economically. And this is understandable when we realise that population growth diverts a lot of investment and effort just to build enough infrastructure and provide enough teachers and doctors and everything else to expand everything at a rate of two or three percent per year in order not to go backwards. Most poor countries simply can't keep up. It's like trying to run up a down escalator. If the escalator is too fast, you end up going backwards. But if you can just slow it down a bit, you start to make headway. The slower it goes, the more benefit you get for the same amount of effort. So it's not just about whether a country is overpopulated, even if it still has a lot of natural resources, its growth rate is a big drag on progress. Our second myth is that population aging will cause economic calamity if we don't boost the population growth to dilute the elderly with ever bigger cohorts of young people. This is a beat up serving the interests of the growth industry and based on transparently nonsensical modeling assumptions. It's just nonsense to assume that the economy is governed by the supply of job seekers rather than by the demand for their labor. But that's exactly what all the modeling assumes. If we look at what actually happened across OECD countries, some of which have aged much more than others, there is no trend at all between the extent of aging and the proportion of people who have employment, nor between the extent of aging and health spending. These charts show this lack of relationship. In contrast, both the bottom charts have significant trends and what has happened is exactly what market theory predicts. A tightening labour market means less unemployment and better conditions for workers, leading to lower inequality. In countries like Australia that have pushed up population growth to counter the effects of ageing, Youth underemployment and housing unaffordability are extremely high and the cost of vast amounts of new infrastructure has blown out government debt. It's a case of the cure being much worse than the disease. But the danger of this aging myth is that even leaders of high fertility countries are believing it 
and are reluctant to reduce birth rates too fast. Some of them think that their young age structure will be an economic boon, ensuring their success while Europe grows old and senesces. Some of them are taking away women's access to contraception to boost the birth rate. This is disastrous for our prospects for peace and sustainability. But where is the UN in all this? It's largely egging on the ageing myths. So I'll finish on that sceptical note, but invite you to please visit the Overpopulation Project, where I have the privilege of working with my colleagues Frank Gottmark and Phil Caffaro to provide a platform for disseminating good science about population and the benefits of reducing population. You can sign up there for our weekly blog post and we're always open to suggestions of um, ideas for the blog. So happy World Population Day and I wish you all the best for the rest of the forum. I wish I could be there in person, but it's a pleasure to have had a chance to speak to you.